Good morning. My name is Basil Besh. I'm going to be talking about a, a Blue Shield shared savings program the California Earth Peak Association was able to uh, negotiate on behalf of its members. I have no disclosures. I was taught to tell them what you're going to talk about, talk about it. Tell them what you talked about, sit down, take questions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history, background, some of the principles underpinning uh, the uh, agreement reached with them, what the current process is, some of the initial problems. It's obviously very young right now and some future directions. A little bit about history. This is way back in 2014, Blue Shield approached us with a desire for shared savings, drive down healthcare costs. Physicians would be doing most of the work. Their initial offer was about a $300 increase in reimbursement. So that was obviously a non-starter and it was just gonna be ineffective in uh, changing behavior in a necessary fashion. We've certainly come a long way since then as we'll see. I'm going to spend a little bit of the beginning of the talk here talking about healthcare economics and how it applies to things like shared savings programs. We'll talk about spending growth, which is the impetus for all of this, the role of the patient and the provider, uh, the impact of risk and insurance, and then finally benefit and design and payment reform, because that's what this really is, things like bundled payments and shared savings. It starts with this. This is the healthcare cost curve. You can see first half of the 20th century uh, pretty much follows normal inflation, second half of the 20th century vastly divergent, right? Uh, most of that cost has been incurred by insurance companies. You see there in blue, gold, gray, and red, but the bottom line is that's passed on to us either through uh, increased taxes for government programs or increased premiums for commercial programs. And this has led to what must be called unsustainable growth. And just for reference points, in the 60s, healthcare made up about 5% of our economy. The military made up 10% of our economy. Today, healthcare makes up 20% of the largest economy in the world. The military only makes up about 5% of our economy. The U.S. has about a $20 trillion economy. 20% of that is roughly $4 trillion. If United States healthcare was a country by itself, it would be the fifth largest economy in the world. And it's growing, right? So projected, this is back in 2019, to be $6.2 trillion, another $2.2 trillion, uh, making it third largest economy in the world. So we have to bend that healthcare cost curve, and that's the incentive or impetus for a lot of these, uh, what you've heard before in these talks today in terms of shifting to outpatient and even to uh, in office, there's financial pressure. I would argue that change is inevitable, so we should embrace it. But I would further argue that where there's change, there's tremendous opportunity for us as physicians. Our profession is actually very well positioned. So we have to understand the why of healthcare economics. Is a technology everybody points to? We have the best technology in the world in healthcare in the United States that must be why it's expensive. Well, in every other sector of society, technology leads to increased quality and decreased cost. Every other sector except healthcare. First computers took up the size of the room, cost millions of dollars, barely any computing capacity at all. Over time, they got smaller, faster, cheaper, now essentially ubiquitous, right? First mobile phones, big blocks, the unique domain of the rich and famous, Gordon Gecko from Wall Street. Today, Name someone who doesn't have a smartphone. And even if we think it's expensive at $1,000, ubiquitous, everybody has it, infinite control, in, infinite computing power in the palm of your hand. So back to this, we see that initially, in the first half of the 20th century, about the same, healthcare diverges somewhere around the 70s. Lo and behold, right after Medicare signed into law in 1965, right? The advent of commercial insurance, even well-intentioned legislation sometimes have untoward consequences. So clearly we have some level of economic dysfunction, I would argue, back to that initial slide about the role of the patient, role of the provider, that there are two disconnects in our healthcare economy, right? Disconnect between who pays and who consumes, disconnect between who pays and who prescribes. So Milton Friedman does this two by two matrix, who's spending whose money on who. So if Dr. Bozik is spending Dr. Bozik's money on Dr. Bozik, he'll seek to economize, right? It's his money, doesn't want to be wasteful, and he'll seek maximum benefit because he's the end user. Dr. Bozik spends Dr. Bozik's money on Dr. Besh. He'll seek to economize, doesn't want to be wasteful with his money, but he doesn't really care the gift I get, right? So as long as it puts a smile on my face initially, and I've gotten gifts from him, and that is actually very true. Situation three, now Dr. Bozik is spending Dr. Besh's money on Dr. Bozik. Holy crap, sky's the limit, right? No need to economize, it's someone else's money. Uh, but he'll certainly seek maximum benefit because he's the end user. So this is how commercial insurance works. Situation four is now Dr. Bozik spending Dr. Besh's money on Dr. Schnazer. 
He neither seeks to economize nor does he care about the quality of the end product. That's actually how government works, right? Taxing one group and paying it on the other. So good luck with that. So back to the current insurance market, disconnect between who pays and who consumes. We've all had some level of experience with this. Somebody comes in with relatively minor knee pain, you say ice, or anti-inflammatories, a brace, maybe some crutches. Come back in a month, if it's not better, we'll get an MRI, make sure there's nothing structural. So well, why don't we just get the MRI now to make sure, right? Well, because 95% of the time this is gonna go away on its own, you don't need an MRI. Yeah, but I have insurance, so the MRI is free. Well, if 10 people pool their risk and they all demand their own MRI, they've all paid for their own MRI just in the delayed fashion through increased premiums. So I have a pretty primitive definition of value. If something's 5% better, cost me 50% more, I'll never do it. Something is 50% better, only cost me 5% more, I'll always do it. When you're disconnected from cost, you only ask one question. Is it 1% better? Yes. It doesn't matter what the cost is, right? So there's no skin in the game. So we already see this being addressed through benefit design, right? Patients have more skin in the game, higher co-pays, higher deductibles, more out-of-pocket expenses. And while the cynic in me will say this is an attempt to cost shift from insurance companies to patients, the truth is, is this is just an attempt to get patients to behave more like rational consumers, right? They have naturally now a hunger for transparency. They cost shop, they ask for elective surgery. Hey, can I find out how much this is gonna cost me before I decide to do it? Disconnect between who pays and who prescribes, whether I put in a $5,000 implant from company X or a $10,000 implant from company Y, I'm largely shielded from that decision because I don't have skin in the game. Again, back to that 5%, 50%, right? 5% more expensive, 50% better, I'll always do it. 5% better, 50% more expensive, I'll never do it. If I'm not paying for it, if it's 1% better, I'll do it. In fact, in the ethical canons of the AMA, a long time ago, it was considered unethical to consider the cost of treatment for your patient. You would be a bad doctor if you considered the cost of treatment. No wonder we are in the mess we're in. Dr. Bozik speaks of this. This is Dr. Michael Porter's, this is Michael Porter's work. Uh, value equals outcomes over cost. Sometimes this matters and sometimes this doesn't. The relative difference and outcome of actually doing a joint replacement is vast. Right? This, is, this is what we advocate for in Washington, D.C. and Sacramento for access to care. The patient gets a hip replacement, their pain is dramatically improved, they're functional, they're mobile, they're less likely to be on welfare, they're less likely to be supported by the state, uh, they're less likely to be on disability. But the relative difference in outcome between the implant you choose is relatively negligible, right? So what do we think? The difference between the best implant and the worst implant? Less than 10%? If it was any more than 10%, the FDA would have pulled that implant, right? But the difference in cost is dramatic. What Kaiser can leverage through purchasing power and what they pay for their hip replacements or knee replacements is vastly cheaper than what we can get in our surgery center or a small hospital uh, that doesn't have market leverage, right? And so in this case, cost becomes the primary driver of value, not quality. As long as you can maintain quality, really values link to cost. Again, benefit design on the provider side, shared savings. Physicians have skin in the game and they're the only ones who can actually determine value because they're the only ones who can determine the need for a treatment, the quality of that treatment, and then once you close the loop by having them have skin in the game and the cost of the treatment, uh, you, you start to get more functional for, uh, markets. Physicians have to own that bundle, right? We've advocated for this for a long time. Again, they're the only ones in a position to determine value. We're all intrinsically familiar with bundled payments, right? So you go to a restaurant, you order a meal, you get a check, you pay your check. You don't pay separately to the landlord uh, for the lease for the building occupied by the restaurant. You don't pay the chef separately to cook your meal. You don't pay the waitress separately to serve your meal. You don't pay the busboy separately to clean up after you. It's one bill. And yet, fee for service, the insurance company is paying all those folks individually rather than a single bill. And somebody needs to be the purveyor of that bundle. Again, the physician is uniquely positioned for that. So bundle payments can roughly be divided into prospective or retrospective. Again, prospective bundles are our cosmetic colleagues are way out ahead of us in this. So here's a breast augmentation, the price, $2,500, that's outward facing. What's included or the definition of the episode of care, you can see the surgeon fee, anesthesia, the implant, uh, the ASC cost, or if done in office, and then follow, routine follow-up visits. A word on the difference between price and cost, price is outward facing. That's what you're charging for something. Cost is what it costs you to complete it. So in this case, the cost would include the ASC, 
either they own their own ASC or they outsource or they have a contract within a local ASC. Uh, they have to negotiate with the anesthesiologist, right? Uh, they have to negotiate with the implant manufacturer. They want high quality and low price because they have skin in the game. The difference between price and cost is obviously profit, right? No different from a restaurant uh, than it is for uh, this plastic surgeon. Orthopedics getting into the same game. This is Rush, Midwest Orthopedics, back in about 2016. Package prices for orthopedic procedures. ACL reconstruction, hip and knee scopes, cuff repairs, shoulder arthroscopy, bundled payments to the outside world, right? That's the price. What the episode of care defined as in this case, right? So they include the surgeon fee, the facility fee, either an ASC or an office. It's fee paid to the anesthesiologist, supplies implants, and uncomplicated follow-up, uncomplicated intimating that they're not bearing risk. They're not an insurance company, right? What's not included, imaging, rehab, home health, DME, and specialty consultation. This is relatively arbitrary, but just needs to be defined in advance. You know what you're getting, right? The episode of care needs to be defined. Again, difference between price and cost. Price is outward facing. That's the top right there. That's the price. The cost is what it costs you to accomplish that task. You have to either have an ASC and staff it, or lease an AFC, lease staff. You have to pay your bills in the office. You have to buy the implants. You have to have the disposables. Uh, you have to negotiate with an anesthesiologist. Difference between price and cost, again, is profit. Have skin in the game. Doctor can determine value because they can determine quality and can control price. Retrospective bundles, Medicare, we are all familiar with CCJR, BPCI, BPCI Advance, and I would argue, I think most folks in the know have seen these to be relatively unsuccessful, right? So this is Dr. Alex Vaccara, one of the original champions of bundled payments, right? Worked with Medicare. He was the one touting it. This is 2021, no regrets about dropping bundle payment model. Why? The innate problem, however, is the intrinsic race to the bottom effect of bundled payments that reduces long-term reimbursements to important stakeholders. So initially you realize good savings, you share the savings, you do well, but if the baseline continues to reset, you can't squeeze more blood out of a rock. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. So we took all this knowledge and actually needed to educate Blue Shield during our negotiating with them to prevent them uh, from making mistakes that would actually cost them money. So Blue Shield Savings Program, again, we needed to define the episode of care, just like we saw in those previous slides. We needed a formula for how we're going to share those savings. We needed a reference point or a starting point for calculating the savings. This is probably the most important thing. We need to make sure that baseline doesn't shift over time because that guarantees a race to the bottom. We needed to maintain quality or at least be able to uh, push back on folks who would say, well, now you have a conflict of interest in reducing cost, you might skimp on quality. So we needed to be able to push back on that by defining that quality was maintained. And then do we share risk? And again, I would argue, no, this is a shared savings, not a shared risk. You can still have skin in the game, save the system tremendous money without bearing the role of being the insurance company yourself. Defining the episode of care, some examples. This is ACA, right? Uh, three days prior to admission through the acute care episode and 30 days post. Again, relatively arbitrary, but needs to be defined in advance. What we came up with Blue Shield is that the bundle includes all the service from the date of surgery, the date of the decision to do surgery, through the surgery and the 90-day global period. It includes pretty much all the spend on that episode of care. Again, what we do lends itself to shared savings or bundled payments because it's episodic in nature, right? So implant, imaging, diagnostics, rehab, DME, post-acute care. Formula for shared savings, they initially came to us and proposed 40% us, 60% them. Impressed upon them the psychology, look, fair is fair, right? You're gonna have a hard enough time getting people to change, changing comfort and mutually exclusive. And to their credit, they actually understood the psychology of it and they came back at 50-50 and that's the final deal with them. So whatever, whatever savings we realize, uh, we get 50% of. Reference point, 2019 cost data by tax ID. So this is a double-edged sword, right? The pros are it's stable, it's pre-COVID data. The cons are it's by tax ID. So if you're solo, it's just you. If you're in a group, you're influenced by what all your other uh, bandmates, so to speak, uh, are doing. 
And then it also punishes those who are already saving the system money, right? Because their reference point is already much lower. So somebody like Dr. Schnazer, who's doing 70% of his cases already outpatient, he actually has less to gain from this. But somebody who's doing 100% of their cases inpatient, man, there's a lot of meat on that bone, right? Shifting baseline, again, this is the most important thing. Initial offer from Blue Shield, again, I don't think this comes from meanness, it just came from ignorance, they didn't know any better, right? that their initial offer was to retarget every single year. That guarantees a race to the bottom. Tremendous savings the first year, a little bit less the second, a little bit less the third. By the time you're at the fourth year, you're squeezing blood out of a rock and it just isn't working. You abandon the program just like Dr. Vaccaro did. You need sustainability for their benefit, not just for ours, and we impressed that upon them and to their credit, once again, they conceded. No retargeting for a full five years. Now, we're not under any delusions. We're setting a little reminder on our iPhones uh, that we need to come back at four years and address this again. As Thomas Jefferson said, right, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. So four years from now, we're going to be sitting down with them saying, hey, we worked out the kinks. This is working well. But if you guys now switch to retargeting every year, you're going to kill the goose that leaves the golden eggs. Maintenance of quality. Again, we discussed this briefly. They initially asked for patient-reported outcome measures. Uh, we said, look, the role of demonstrating maintenance of quality so nobody can point the finger at you and say, now that you have skin in the game, you have conflict of interest, you're going to cut corners and skimp. Uh, nope. You demonstrate quality and you say, we maintain the same quality and save the system a tremendous amount of money, and we benefited from it. So as long as there's no change in practice pattern, no change in quality, uh, the savings can be seen as not having had any deleterious effect on the patient at all. Risk, right? Insurance companies, cost fluctuations, unforeseen length of stay, unrelated medical events, rehospitalization. What we don't want is a situation where somebody has an MI on the table, 30 days in an ICU, and they basically consume the totality of the savings, right? We're not an insurance company, right? We're doctors. And in fact, it's not called shared risk, it's called shared savings, right? So we need to insulate the surgeon from costly but rare occurrences. We're not talking about a guy who has a 20% dislocation rate on his hip replacements. We're talking about and am I on the table in a long ICU stay? Otherwise, it leads to cherry picking and lemon dropping, right? So you basically, uh, surgeons are gonna behave in their own self-interest. So if they're worried about somebody who's risky, you know, taking away the totality of the savings, they're gonna be very picky and choosy about which cases they do, and you're gonna have an entire generation of, uh, of folks who don't have the right access to care because their risk factors are too high. So, one option, shared savings either case by case or eliminate outliers, right? Untoward events should be eliminated from the calculations. Again, it's shared savings. You can still get the maximum benefit for both parties. And in fact, if you look at, you know, the stratification of payment models, the subtle difference between shared savings and bundles is whether you assume risk or not. And that's something we know we'll also have to go back to the table with them because they're going to want to pass some of that risk along. Again, I don't see a huge difference between surgeons in terms of their MI rate on the table. It's a very uncommon occurrence, and I don't think one surgeon has a much higher rate of it than another. So let's finish up with just a sample, and this is just a sample. Don't say Besh promised me anything, all right? So this is a typical Medicare joint replacement episode. It costs roughly $25,000, right? It includes inpatient stay, which includes the implant through a DRG, includes three next three are post acute. Interestingly, this is the physician payment for a joint replacement. Out of a $25,000 episode, it's about $1,700. Physicians make up about 8% of the healthcare spend in this country. We control 90% of the spending. The single most expensive device in all of healthcare is a physician's pen. We write orders and people spend money. We wield a tremendous amount of power. We don't use it as well as we should. So go back to this example, right? Where are the opportunities for saving? Well, Dr. Schnauzer gave a tremendous talk, and Ms. Stanek backed it up with data, about shifting these cases from inpatient to outpatient, right? So this is just a typical episode. Now, this is not taking into account commercial payer, 150% of Medicare. This is just Medicare numbers, right? As a baseline. The DRG is about 13,000. CPT is about 8,000, right? So just shifting that Medicare case, now that they're off the inpatient only list, Saves you about $5,000 shifting it from uh, inpatient to outpatient. Uh, 
The next category in, together is post-acute care, right? Skilled nursing facility, inpatient rehab, and home health, right? Together, adding up to about $9,000. So if we shift that case from inpatient to outpatient savings, about $5,000. It's not unreasonable to think that out of that 9,000, you know, hospitals have nurse case managers because they get paid for a DRG and they want to get their length of stay down. They don't care where that patient goes. They have good, they have good relationships with skilled nursing facilities. Get them out, get them out, get them out. Day one, day two at the, at the top, right? They're not getting paid anymore. They're not charging per day in the hospital, right? Average length of stay at a skilled nursing facility for a Medicare patient, 21 days, also the maximum, right? It's like a roach motel. You check in, you don't check out. So, so a lot of this is overutilized. It's overutilized not because people are evil, just they don't have skin in the game, right? A lot of post-acute care is overutilized. Tremendous opportunity for savings. Save another 5,000 on post-acute care, now you've reduced that bundle from 25,000 by about 10,000, 40%. $10,000 total savings, we said, cut a deal with Blue Shield, it's 50-50. The surgeon gets an extra 5,000. Their initial surgeon fee, just under 1,700. Extra 5,000, now it's just a little bit under 7,000. I'm not promising you anything. I'm saying this is the potential in a, sure, in a shared savings program, right? Clearly, this is a new program. We've had growing pains. What happens in big companies like Blue Shield, the left hand doesn't talk to the right hand, right? You got your think tank, great idea, looks good on paper, gonna take time to implement. Initially, they required a minimum of 15 cases. We said, why? Well, why a minimum? You're excluding people. Like, <laughs> savings of 10 grand on one case isn't worth it to you, right? To their credit, again, hot off the presses, they reduced it to a minimum of five. We're hoping that there is no minimum at all. They're having difficulty capturing the data initially, right? This is, they're stuck doing things the way they've always done them, and change in comfort are mutually exclusive. So we advise that it's important for the surgeon to keep their own data, right? And again, Blue Shield, to their credit, at least is gonna assign a point person that you can call directly and say, hey, you know, first quarter I've done 38 joints. I wanna make sure I'm getting credit for them. Can I cross-reference this with your list, please? Currently, no pathway for employed physicians. Actually, this one is also hot off the presses. They just came up with language mandating that if the shared savings flow through an employer, at least half of the shared savings need to go to the surgeon. So this applies to folks in things like foundation models, right? Uh, where they don't bill directly, but they do deserve, not just deserve, the system is more functional when they get, uh, when they have skin in the game and have access to this uh, shared savings. Future directions, we need to fix the growing pains. Ask everybody to be patient, do their part, and not declare it a failure just because it didn't work overnight. The fundamentals are there and the fundamentals are strong, and the wind is at our back, frankly. We need to increase adoption by surgeons. Again, change is difficult, getting people to change what they do, particularly in healthcare. It took the King of England 30 years uh, to put uh, oranges and lemons on his uh, majesty's ships to prevent scurvy, right? So things change slowly in healthcare. And actually adoption by other payers, right? So as was mentioned earlier, it's not just Blue Shield. Actually, Blue Shield wants us to get this adopted by Cigna, United Healthcare, First Health, all the other companies. There's a small, but not zero risk of somebody coming after for gain sharing and kickback and all those nasty things. The more insurance companies adopt this, uh, the less likely for attorney generals to uh, get a cause du jour. It seems impossible until it's done. Clearly this rock is only halfway up the hill, right? So we gotta keep pushing. Our work isn't done, but again, I think that the future is very, very bright for us in our profession. Thank you. Thank you.